Hey guys, hope all is going well for you. Really enjoying your conversations. Uh, I can see that you are, amongst other things, struggling with this concept of freedom, spiritual freedom, moksha, within the Upanishads. Well, thankfully, there are some traditional responses to this that try to help make sense out of this oh-so-paradoxical idea that we're dealing with here. Um, as you no doubt have noticed, the idea of moksha is a uh, tricky one because it, because it involves a paradox, basically. On one hand, there's this fundamental idea of freedom, of liberation from samsara, the thing that we all aspire towards. But on the other side of it, moksha itself seems to be something that really is rather, uh, it's inconceivable. How do you think about something that is beyond the limitations of finitude? How do you think about something that's beyond the limitations of the individual self or individual consciousness? You can't. The moment you start thinking about it, you know what you're doing? You're not thinking about it anymore. Kenna Upanishad more or less says this in the midst of it. And, um, and that makes it a difficult thing to even begin to comprehend. So how is it possible to think about this? Much less, how is this idea of, of moksha even relevant in the 21st century, the way I was asking you about it? Well, let me tell you about how the, the tradition itself approaches this. Now, this isn't, I should say right off the bat, this isn't something you're going to find in the Upanishads. The place you find it is in the commentaries on the Upanishads, in the tradition uh, called Vedanta that I've, I've mentioned a few times, and all the different uh, avenues of Vedanta. There's different kinds of Vedanta. But they do deal with this idea, uh, this way of making sense out of moksha, out of freedom. And the way that they do it, one of the ways they do it, there's lots of ways they do it, but one of the ways they do it is through something called the Purusharthas. The Purusharthas. I'll spell that for you in the threads there for us, but Purusharthas. Now, literally, the Purusharthas mean those things to be desired in life. The, the uh, spiritual wealth, really, is what it means. And there are, in the division of the Purusharthas, four, count them, four, right here, uh, basic purachartas uh, to speak of. There is first and foremost, not foremost, but first, uh, something called kama. Now kama means pleasure, uh, desire. It's the ka not karma, but kama, like K-A-M-A, -A, kama. And it it's the kama, this is the kama of the Kama Sutra kama, which I'm sure you've heard about before. This is usually put forward as the first of the Purusharthas. Now, why is it the first of the Purusharthas? Well, if you think about the object of Kama, the object of Kama is physical ecstasy, right? Hence the Kama Sutra. <laughs> Again, if you haven't read it, well, you'll have to check out Amazon.com and get that for yourself. It's a, it's a fun perusing. But anyway, um, uh, uh, being cheeky here, but 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 you know what I mean. The, this has to do with with physical ecstasy, and the the interesting thing about what happens with physical ecstasy, if if you think about it philosophically for a moment, what you have is a sense of boundlessness in space and time, right? But the interesting thing about this boundlessness is this: the boundlessness is limited entirely to you physically. Uh, so that the, the boundlessness of it, the freedom of it, the openness of it is just you, and, and really it's just you in terms of your physical body. And the boundlessness in terms of, of time is really just a moment. It's an instant. It's this instant of ecstasy, whatever it might be, sexual or some other physical ecstasy. Um, in this respect, you're having a little glimpse, a little sense of moksha, a taste of it. But it is a speck upon a speck, upon a speck, upon a speck of what the possibilities of that are. Let me say something about the second of the Purusharthas, Artha. Now, Artha well, is, literally means uh, wealth, but probably I, I think a better translation of it would be uh, success, progress, prosperity, something like that. It's the growing and well-being uh, within the, the community. Now, this idea of artha, if you, if you think about it for a moment, doesn't just apply to individuals. Here, again, we have the sense of the fullness of the possibility of something being what it can be. 
But instead of that fullness being simply limited to us, to our individuality, to our individual physical state, or even our individual mental state, that fullness of possibility has been, for lack of a better word, dilated. It's been brought out to the entire community and to the lifetime of the community so that we see an exponential unfolding, as it were, of the fullness of the possibility of things being what they might be. Now let's take that to the third of, of the Purusharthas, Dharma. Dharma, this is, this is a very tricky word in this tradition. Um, dharma literally means uh, moral law, duty, uh, sometimes it's translated as ethical merit. It can mean all of these things in different contexts. And when the Buddhists get a hold of it, not the Brahmanical tradition as much, but the Buddhists get a hold of it, they're going to mean a whole host of other things that I'll talk to you about in a little bit, trying not to try to explain it. Um, it's a bit too much right here. But suffice to say for us, when the Brahmanical tradition talks about it, when, when Vedanta talks about it, when you have the idea of Dharma and the Upanishads, or the, what comes out of the Upanishads, what you have is a sense of... Um, uh, of moral law, of, of duty, of something being right simply because it's right. Now here, the good that we're talking about no longer is limited simply to the physical manifestation of the good. No longer is it simply limited to the social manifestation of the good. The good we're talking about here has to do with the good of the entirety of the universe. I mean, after all, I, I, I realize one of the things that people might say about this is saying, well, you know, different cultures, different societies, di even different people might have different moral laws. Yeah, I suppose that's true, and we can disagree about them, or we may never be able to agree about them. But when you think about w the way in which a moral law is held, the way that you hold moral laws is universal. The way you hold moral laws is as a, a broad universal truth, a universal principle, right? Well, in this respect, what you have is a third dilation. No longer are we just talking about an individual, a good that extends through our individuality. No longer are we talking about a good that, that extends socially. We're talking about a good that extends universally. We're talking about a good that is good, that is right, that needs to be the way it is, for the sake of the totality of all things, right? That extends to the beginning and the ending of the universe. Now, say that, and it sounds like, well, okay, then, so Dharma is the highest good, isn't it? Uh, mm, yes and no. It's a reflection of the highest good insofar as it extends across the universe. But the interesting thing about Dharma is Dharma is still thought of in terms of particulars. What you have here is a sense in which perhaps some of, the, some of the highest things that we can achieve, uh, uh, the highest moral achievements, the highest sense of good, the highest sense of freedom that we can find as embodied beings, as finite beings, as beings with ego, as beings with individuality. But there is still underneath this one last principle, and that's moksha itself. That's liberation from the cycle of samsara. That is knowing Atman as Atman. Now this, as we were saying, this is a paradox. To try to embrace and understand the true self as true self, to some extent you can't do that as an individual. I mean, I, even me, I've read about this stuff for a long time, talking about it. If you ask me, can I imagine actually what it's like? I know the one thing I'm doing is not imagining it, because as my mind works, I put limits on things, I have to think in these particular ways, this is where I am. But one thing we can say, and this is key, key, this is a central point I want you to realize within this, is that that good, that freedom, is coloring each and everything that we do and aspire towards. It colors our desire for pleasure. It colors our desire for wealth. It colors our desire for what we call the good, right? It is in everything we do. You want to know where moksha is? Not just in the 21st century, but anywhere. It is in all of our aspirations. It is in all of our hopes. It is in everything that we think about, that we desire, that we hope for. It is our sense of what is worthwhile. It is those things to be desired in the world. And it is coming to have a clearer and clearer sense of this, cultivating ourselves, refining ourselves, our possibility, our nature, so that we can have a clearer and clearer sense of it. This is what the pursuit of moksha is all about. Far from being impractical, it's an everything we do. It's just coming to a place where we can understand that. 
All right, I'll talk to you more about it later.